Hello everyone, today we will be analyzing in detail the best romantic matches for each incarnation of The Legend of Zelda's protagonist, Link. We Zelda fans usually strongly like or dislike certain characters so much that we ship them with Link despite any contradicting facts or situations that would realistically prevent the ship from ever being canon. No really, some of us are so adamant about who we ship our protagonist with that we're willing to fight to the death with anyone who disapproves of the ship, but in most cases just arguments over the interwebs. Anyways, here we will analyze each Link's relationships with a variety of characters to once and for all decide who the best match for each Link is. This video will be the first of a two-part series, and in this session we will explain why some iterations of Link don't have enough evidence to justify a romance within the games, being the heroes from Zelda 1 and 2, Diminish Cap, Four Swords, Four Swords Adventures, and A Link Between Worlds. Following my explanation for why those games do not have a definitive match for each of those respective links, we will analyze the love interests for The Goddess's Chosen Hero, aka the Hero of Legend or Hero of the Sky, from Skyward Sword, the Hero of Time from Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, and the Hero of Twilight from Twilight Princess. In the next video, coming soon, we will discuss The Legendary Hero from A Link to the Past, The Oracle of Ages and Seasons, and Link's Awakening. Small Fry, aka the Waker of Winds from The Wind Waker and Phantom Hourglass, the Royal Engineer of Spirit Tracks, and the Hylian Champion from Breath of the Wild. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the notification bell so you will know when the next part is released. On that note, let's get started. My name is Andy, and welcome to Zelda. We are going to begin to go over the links that don't have enough reasonable love interests for Link, starting with the games that launched the series, the OG Legend of Zelda and the Adventure of Link. During the era of the NES, the story and lore of the Zelda franchise was still being developed and mainly had the feel of a medieval fantasy world with the cliché Save the Princess routine. Unless you for some reason want to ship Link with one of the old ladies he finds throughout the world or Impa, the only possible romance Link has in the original Le Legend of Zelda is Zelda herself. Even the ship doesn't have much grounds for a couple of reasons. Zelda is only shown at the very end of the game after defeating Ganon, and the closest interaction they have to romance is Zelda telling him, Thanks Link, you're the hero of Hyrule. Not even a, you're my hero? Kinda lame, I know. And unfortunately Zelda 2, aka the adventure Link, is in the same situation as its predecessor. Except now, there is a choice between two different Zeldas, the one from the previous game, and the Zelda playing Sleeping Beauty. There isn't any more content given on the previous Zelda, and the only thing from the new Zelda that can be taken as romantic is her giving him an embrace as the curtain falls at the closure of the game. It's not shown whether this was just a hug or a thankful kiss, but it really doesn't matter. It's still just part of the cliché save the princess trope, and doesn't mean there is a romantic relationship. Now it is worth noting the healing ladies who wear luxurious red dresses. During the adventure, Link can stop in each village and go into these ladies' houses and come out with full health. It's rather suspicious, and I'll let everyone else use their imagination on what's going on in there. But really, come on Nintendo, I thought this was a family company and a kids game. Anyways, Four Swords, Four Swords Adventures, and the Minish Cap are excluded from our analysis because there isn't any clear love interest presented and or hinted at by any content within the games. In these games, Link and Zelda are childhood friends, but they're still young, and their relationship is clearly just friendship. Malin also appears in the Minish Cap and Four Swords Adventures, but lacks the relationship she has with Link and Ocarina of Time. I'm not saying Z-Link and Malin ships are impossible for these games, but for these games it's basically fanfiction. The last Link I decided doesn't have a probable ship is from A Link Between Worlds. This was a tough decision for me, as I could pick out a few matches for Link, but they were mostly far-fetched. The first match I was considering analyzing up was Irene, the witch's granddaughter. Link and Irene seem to become friends after meeting, and she even gives him rides around Hyrule on her broom. However, there isn't any suggestive dialogue between the two, so I had to rule her out as a candidate. The only other two characters in the story that have potential are Zelda and Hilda. Link does not directly have a close relationship with either Zelda or Hilda, but Link's low ruling counterpart, Ravio, certainly does. If playing in hero mode, Ravio's diary can be read from his house in Lowrule, which shows his relationship with Hilda. It reads, She wants to do the right thing. I wish I could help her. 
but leaving is my only option. She's being duped. Doesn't she realize that? He's just a leech. There's no choice but to go. I have so little magic, enough to go there. Maybe not to come back, but tomorrow must be the day. I may never see her again, but I vow to save her from all this. This not only shows his intentions to help save Lowrule and Hyrule, but also to help his princess, who he appears to care for, realize and correct her wrongdoings. From this, I can say a ship between Ravio and Hilda is possible, and reasonable. But unless you go out on a limb and say Link and Zelda have to be together because of their counterparts, Ravio's and Hilda's relationship, there's not much more romance to get from this game. Now that's out of the way, let's begin our analysis with the first Link in the timeline, from Skyward Sword. Skyward Sword has a good amount of NPCs, all of which have their own unique personalities and livelihoods to them. Among these characters are Kina and Karain, who are friendly acquaintances of Link, but don't have anywhere near as much potential as the others. That being said, our only competitive bachelorettes for the Hero of the Sky are Beatrice, the Item Check Girl, and of course, Link's childhood best friend, Zelda. It's worth noting that some fans ship Link with Fee, but this is actually an impossible match. Fee is the spirit that resides within the Goddess Slash Master Sword, which is laid to rest at the end of Skyward Sword, and supposedly remains there until the events of Ocarina of Time. The Temple of Time was even built on top of the Sealed Temple from Skyward Sword, and there is not a known occurrence of the Master Sword being drawn between the two games. If you'd like to know more about this topic, I briefly discussed it at the end of one of our theory videos explaining how the Sacred Realm could have originated from the Silent Realm. Another reason Fee absolutely cannot be a in a romantic relationship with Link, other than being a robotic spirit without true emotions, is she even says she will enter a deep sleep without end at the end of Skyward Sword. Now that I've finished explaining why shipping Fee and Link is ridiculous, let's get back to our two candidates, starting with Beatrice. It's clear that Beatrice has an unhealthy crush on Link. As you progress throughout the game and revisit the item check in the bazaar, Beatrice will initiate every interaction by flirting, starting off subtle, but as time progresses, gets to the point of calling him darling. Some of her dialogue goes as follows. I don't suppose, you don't come here just to see me, do you? Um, nothing. There's nothing wrong. It's not like, oh hey, that guy's back. I'm so happy or anything like that. But, if you think how often we meet, you have to admit that our relationship has gone beyond employee and customer, you know? You. You came to see me. I'm so happy. And it gets even cringier as we go on, so I'm just gonna stop there. The player gets to choose whether to play along with the flirting or completely shut her down. There's a side quest where Link can go speak with Pietra's father, Peter and he'll explain how he thinks his daughter has an unwanted admirer, regardless of what, whatever responses the player has said to Beatrice at this point, and wants Link to figure out who it is. Afterwards, the player, or Link, can choose to confess his love to Beatrice, which will make her all giddy, and give him five gratitude crystals, or blatantly tell her that he only comes for the item check, and that's it. If he does the latter, Link will tell her father Peter what's really going on, and will, he will reward him with five gratitude crystals. Ultimately though, Beatrice really isn't significant in the lore of the game because whether you confess love, in air quotes, to Beatrice or despise her, it really doesn't affect the story and Link's actions regarding Zelda. Speaking of Zelda, let's get into her. Uh, I mean, let's talk about her. Anyone who has played Skyward Sword is familiar with the bond between this Link and Zelda. The opening sections of the game even directly imply a romantic relationship between Zelda and Link. Their closeness is shown immediately by Link being woken up by Zelda's Loftwing delivering a letter she wrote, and through Zelda having given Link the nickname, Sleepyhead. Zelda's father, Headmaster Kapora, even lets us know that Link and Zelda have been close since they were young children, and even tells how Zelda was upset when Link began spending so much time with his, with his Loftwing, saying, Do you recall when Link and that Loftwing of his first met? What a sight. The little boy just hopped up on that bird and gracefully flew away without even a moment of instruction. They were meant for each other, and judging by how jealous you were that day, I'd say that the friendship he shared with his bird didn't go unnoticed by you, my dear. You can even see by the look on Zelda's face that she loves Link more than a friend, and it's implied Link feels the same way through his embarrassment when Zelda sees him lazily gazing at the sky. As the story progresses, the hints suggesting a love interest between the two main characters gets much stronger. We're introduced to Groose, who obviously has a huge crush on Zelda, which kind of makes a comedic high school style love triangle, except for the fact that Zelda's never shown to like Groose in any way until they all become friends at the end of the game, but that's an important. 
Bruce views Link as lazy and thinks that he doesn't deserve Zelda's attention despite their close friendship, and goes as far as imprisoning Link's Loftwing in an attempt to prevent Link from competing in the wing ceremony and getting the sailcloth that Zelda crafted for the ceremony. However, for poor Groose, Zelda has plans to make sure Link won her sailcloth. Later on in the game, the player can access Zelda's bedroom, where Link can go through Zelda's diary which reads, Today is the big day, the wing ceremony. Finally Link can take a big step forward to becoming a knight. I can't wait to see him promoted to full knighthood, but I'm a little worried he might have some trouble winning the race. Lately, Link hasn't taken his flight training seriously. Someone needs to make sure he doesn't mess up his chance. So I've made up my mind. Tomorrow, I'll wake him up extra early and make sure he gets some last minute practice whether he likes it or not. He has to win, or we won't be able to perform the wing ceremony together. She seems to want that moment with Link at least as much as Cruz wants it with her. During the ceremony following Link's victory, there's one moment that makes Zelda history. Zelda starts to get a little flirty during the ceremony and asks Link if he knows what the last part of the ceremony is. The player can choose three different responses, one of which is simply, uh-oh. If the player chooses that option, Zelda will coincidentally say, and just what are you thinking, and regardless of whatever response is chosen, she steps forward, getting so close to Link it looks like they're going to freaking kiss. Then she makes me want to punch my TV by telling Link he has to jump off the statue, and then pushes him off. These two make a cute couple, but dang, Zelda knows how to kill the mood. And nearly kill Link, too. Anyways, after the two perform the ceremony, Zelda even asks Link out by asking if he would like to go fly around the clouds with her, which they are shown doing in the very next scene. She tells him how wonderful performing the ceremony was with him, and that she will always remember the day. These hidden bits in the game show how much Zelda wanted to perform the ceremony with Link, and suggest that Zelda might love Link, but is it mutual? The answer is unarguably yes. If you look back at the scene near the beginning of the game, with Gapora's monologue and Zelda gazing at Link, the name of the track playing is appropriately titled Romance. Another variation of the song, called Romance in the Air, is also played during Link's and Zelda's quote-unquote date when they go out flying together. Is the fact that these titles are called Romance and there's a Romance in the Air, pun intended, a coincidence? I think not. I highly doubt the romantic theme would be pushed so strongly here if there wasn't a mutual interest. We can also determine whether Link loves Zelda romantically when she gives her sailcloth to him during the ceremony. Link does his goofy, you got an item pose, and the game text says, you got the sailcloth. Now you can jump from any height without fear of a painful landing. And in small text it says, it smells nice too. This is likely the developer's comedic way of letting the player know that Link is glad to have won the race and Zelda's gift. Zelda is also shown to be the most important person in his life and is justified by Zelda slash Hylia during an emotional cutscene where she says, I knew that if it meant saving Zelda, you would throw yourself headfirst into any danger, without even a moment's doubt. I used you. Shortly after, she begins to seal herself away to maintain the seal and demise, and during this, she tells Link that even though she is highly a reborn as a mortal, she is still her father's daughter, and more importantly, she tells him, I am still your Zelda. When the sealing is complete and the glowing within the amber-like crystal Zelda is sealed within stops, Link just looks at her and cries. This is the only time in any Zelda game where Link is actually shown crying, so this just shows how much he cares for Zelda. Once Link unites the Triforce and destroys Demise in their time, Zelda awakens from her slumber and begins to walk towards Link. She begins to stumble, and Link runs forward to catch her in his arms. When she regains her strength, she tells him, Good morning, sleepyhead. Then they are shown walking out hand in hand to go see Impa and Groose. This is such a heartwarming moment that if it isn't considered sweet and romantic, then I don't know what is. Let's rewind a bit to discuss the lopsided love triangle we mentioned previously between Link, Zelda, and Groose, which is broken prior to this emotional cutscene. When Link awakens the Gate of Time and defeats the Imprisoned, Link looks back at Groose before he walks through the gate, as if asking Groose to come with him. However, Groose chooses to stay behind and says he'll make sure the Imprisoned doesn't break free again, and asks Link to tell Zelda what's up for him. Here, Groose is basically telling Link, Hey, I'm not the guy I thought I was. You're the guy meant for this. Go get her. 
Although Groose was kind of a jerk at the beginning, this is where you can tell Link and Groose begin to become friends, and we can begin to sympathize with Groose a lot more. I've read and heard theories about, from other fans about how Link and Zelda could have had a romantic relationship prior to the events of the game, and Zelda's duty to protect the Triforce and knowledge of her divine origin at the end of the game caused them not to pursue a romantic relationship. Now, I must admit, the thought of not to ship Link and Zelda because of their duties and new experience is a mature thought, but we have mentioned too many signs to prove the romantic relationship for this not to be the case. And I've saved one last thing from, from the end of the game to put this to rest. My final piece of evidence to prove that Z-Link is the most reasonable ship for the goddess's chosen hero lies within the post credit scene. In this scene, we see other inhabitants of Skyloft come down to the surface such as Colin, Stritch, and Zelda's father, Gapora. Towards the end, we see Colin, Stritch, and Gruz fly away on their loft wings. Then Zelda tells Link that she wants to live on the surface and asks Link what he will do now. He simply gives her a big smile, then immediately after, their two loft wings fly into the sky, side by side, just like a couple. I believe it's most logical to interpret the loft wings flying off together to mean Link is choosing to stay behind with Zelda on the surface. If this hasn't convinced you of the Skyward Sword Z-Link for whatever reason, I don't know what else to say. This is probably the most canon romance Link has in the entire franchise, so sorry, I've given the facts, and I'm right. I'm not even sorry to say that Pietrus doesn't stand a chance against Zelda, so that means Zelda is the Hero of Sky's best match. The next Link we have in line is the Hero of Time from Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. This time there's a lot more competition. Our notable bachelorettes that we will analyze consist of Saria, the Kokiri, who was the Hero of Time's childhood friend, Princess Ruto of the Zora, of course, Princess Zelda, and finally, Malin, the young redhead girl from Lon Lon Ranch. We are also giving an honorable mention to Naburu of the Gerudo. There isn't necessarily any evidence suggesting a romantic relationship between her and Link, but she does say some suspicious things to him, such as she'll do something great for him if he helps her, and later in the Chamber of Sages tells him, If only I knew you would become such a handsome man, I should have kept the promise I made back then. Really, how is Ocarina of Time rated appropriate for kids? Point is, there is some suggestive content here, and I've seen a small number of people ship Link and Nabooru because of these small details, but other than that, there's nothing to justify a romance between them, not to mention the huge age gap. It's also important that we're only looking for a match for the Hero of Time leading to the child timeline only, since he no longer is present in the adult timeline. It's kind of sad when you think about it for the adult timeline, but at least Link knows what the older versions of these people will be like in the future. The first real interest we're going to talk about is Saria. When Link is initially leaving Kokiri Forest, Saria stops Link at the bridge, and we can see from the look on her face that she's sad to see him leave. She then tells him that she knew he would leave one day because he wasn't a Kokiri, and despite this, asks him, We'll be friends forever, won't we? Saria then gives Link her ocarina and says, When you play my ocarina, I hope you will think of me and come back to the forest to visit me. Link later does come back to the forest and travels through the Lost Woods to find Saria in the sacred forest meadow. Here, she is sitting on a tree stump and says this is her favorite place to be, then teaches Link Saria's song. After Link travels seven years into the future, Link comes back to this location and finds Saria's tree stump vacant. The cutscene in the game highlights the empty stump and shows Link staring at the stump for a while before Sheik interrupts his thinking. We don't know exactly what this is supposed to mean, but I'm willing to bet Link is recalling his memories of Saria and wishing to see her again. At first glance, a Saria and Young Link ship is cute, but once we incorporate some lore, we can easily see this isn't practical. The Kokiri remain children forever, and although Link is raised as a Kokiri, he is actually Hylian, which means he becomes an adult while she never will. Additionally, sages appear to sacrifice their normal lives throughout the entire series. This is shown in the post credit scenes of Ocarina of Time, where we see the sages flying across the sky in balls of light, then regaining their physical forms and looking down upon Hyrule. We can even see Maido and King Sora lamenting over the loss of Saria and Princess Ruto, respectively. Overall, these reasons make it impossible for a Salink relationship from being a reality, despite their close bond. The next bachelorette we have in line is Princess Ruto. The two first meet inside Jabu Jabu's belly as kids. She is really autocratic with Link right from the beginning, just as she is with everyone else, but after he rescues her, she seems to have developed a huge crush on him. 
After escaping from Jabu Jabu's belly, Princess Ruto agrees to give Link the Zora Sapphire, then later describes it as the Zora's engagement ring, and that her mother instructed her to give it only to the man who will be her husband. Link doesn't really acknowledge this at all, and seems to just take it because he needs it to open the door of time. Later, Link can talk to his Zora in the Zora's domain, who will tell him that he is all Ruto's been talking about lately. In the future, within the Water Temple, Ruto even refers to Link as her fiancé, and tells them she never forgot the vows we made to each other. Then, after defeating the Water Temple, she tells him, As a reward, I grant my eternal love to you, and you can see here that Link flinches. Then she continues to say, Well, that's what I want to say, but I don't think I can offer that now. I think here it's clear to see that Link's and Ruto's relationship goes along the lines of, I love him, but he doesn't love me back, due to Link's reaction to the Chamber of Sages and general dismissiveness of their engagement. Even if Link did love Ruto back, there was no way they could have ended up together. The Hero of Twilight is known to be a direct descendant of the Hero of Time, and he doesn't appear to be part Zora, so we can determine that the Hero of Time did not end up making babies with Ruto. Now that we're done discussing Ruto, we're left with two more major candidates, Zelda and Malin. Let's begin with Zelda. When Link meets Zelda early on in Ocarina of Time, she immediately trusts him just because he resembles someone from her dreams, which seems a little odd. Then again, they're only about 10 years old at this time, so she could have been just naive rather than telling Link everything because she had an instant crush on him. Between the events of Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, Zelda tells Link, Although it was only a short time, I feel like I've known you forever. I'll never forget the days we spent together in Hyrule, and I believe in my heart that a day will come when I shall meet you again. I'm praying that your journey be a safe one. What we can take from this is that when Link was returned back to his original time at the end of Ocarina of Time and went to warn Zelda of Ganondorf's plans, he also spent a significant amount of time with her, and the two became close friends. Just because they became good friends doesn't mean they could have a romantic relationship, but let's delve deeper. In Ocarina of Time, Zelda disguised as Sheik poetically told him, Time passes, people move on. Like a river's flow, it never ends. A childish mind will turn to noble ambition. Young love will become deep affection, and yada yada. I believe Zelda, while in disguise, could be confessing to a crush she immediately had on him while they were kids, which has also grown into, quote, deep affection. Ruto even asks in the Chamber of Sages, you're searching for Princess Zelda, right? Ha, you can't hide anything from me. Which only makes me think that Zelda slash Sheik was referring to her own young love slash deep affection. Then again, this is just my interpretation, and Zelda could have been referring to Ruto since this is said in the Ice Cavern of Zora's Domain, before the Water Temple, where Link encounters Ruto again. Now my last exhibit that could suggest a romance between Zelda and the Hero of Time is a little far-fetched, but please bear with me. At the end of Majora's Mask, the Happy Mask Salesman tells Link right before his departure, Shouldn't you be returning home as well? Whenever there is a meeting, a parting is sure to follow. However, that parting need not last forever. Whether the parting be forever, or merely a short time, that is up to you. Zelda's only appearance in Majora's Mask is the cutscene I mentioned earlier, where Zelda is giving her farewells before hers and Link's parting. Majora's Mask has many deep messages and quotes in it, and this is no exception. To Link this could mean that although he and Zelda have parted for now, he can choose to reunite with Zelda if that's what he decides is most important for him. Like I said previously, this idea is rather far-fetched for a couple of reasons. First off, this is just one interpretation of the quote, and it's said right before Link leaves Termina, so it's more likely to be intended for his farewell with Tattle, Tail, and Skull Kid. Secondly, if we interpret it to apply to Link's parting with Zelda, we also have to allow it to apply to other characters, such as Saria, Navi, and even Malin, who we will talk about in just a second. Although my interpretation of the Happy Mask Salesman's quote is flimsy, all the previously mentioned evidence is still valid, making Zelda a highly possible match for Link. Before we conclude who the best match for the Hero of Time is, we still need to discuss Malin's connection with Link. The two first meet in Castletown as kids. She immediately notices, notices Link's Kokiri clothes and Navi, then begins to call him Fairy Boy. It sounds just like the type of demeaning, yet cute nickname an elementary school girl would give to a boy they like. Later, over at Lon Lon Ranch, Malin is found singing what is known as Epona Song. She then tells Link that her mother taught it to her before she passed away, and proceeds to teach it to Link. If Malin wasn't already fond of Link, she likely would not be sharing such personal details about her life so soon. I can also confidently say that Link left a meaningful impression on Malin, and this isn't just some spontaneous crush of the week. 
Malin recognizes Link after seven years, not by his appearance, but by the way he interacts with Epona and knows her song. Malin's father, Talon, also gives a large hint into a romance between Malin and Link. In the chicken coop, Link can play a minigame which Talon calls the Super Cuckoo Finding Minigame, where Link needs to find three Super Cuckoos among a normal flock within 30 seconds. After succeeding, Talon says to Link, Hey you, you've got the talent to be one of the world's best cowboys. How'd you like to marry Malin, huh? Ha ha. I was just kidding. I think you're a little young for that, aren't you? Ha ha ha. Talon is usually depicted as a lazy, head-in-the-clouds dude, so I don't think this is just some witty joke he made up on the spot. He was probably telling Link what he was really thinking, then realized it's not appropriate for their age and tried to cover it up. Nevertheless, this can really strengthen Malin's chances at matching with Link. The last hint we get as a child in Ocarina of Time is from a gossip stone outside the Temple of Time, which states, They say that Malin of Lon Lon Ranch hopes a knight in shining armor will come and sweep her off her feet someday. Link may not have the shining armor, but he sure does make a good knight. This plus all the small details we mentioned earlier is enough to justify a possible romance between Link and Malin. There are many theories out there claiming that in one way or another the events of Majora's Mask were not real, and I'm not going to go into the details right now, that's for another time. Hint hint. For now, I'm just going to assume Malin's adult and child counterparts, respectively Kremia and Romani, represent the connection between Malin and Link. We'll be making a theory video soon regarding Termina, which will help justify this assumption, so please bear with us. Romani is constantly calling Link cute and even gives him the nickname Grasshopper, similar how to Malin called him Fairy Boy. Although Link learned Epona's song from Malin in Ocarina of Time, the player cannot actually play the song Majora's Mask until Romani reteaches it to him. She describes it as the song of two who are bound by trust. Not only are Romani and Child Malin physically identical, but also behave the same way too. In fact, each of these things I've mentioned happened previously with Malin in Ocarina of Time, so I believe it's reasonable to make the claim that despite whether Termina is real or not, Romani and Kremia represent interactions between Malin and Link. The way that Romani also describes Epona's song is also interesting, the song of two who are bound by trust. On the surface level, players who would just assume that she is referring to the bond between Link and Epona. However, if we remember that Malin's mother taught her the song, obviously before she passed away, we can tie some strings together. Malin routinely sings this song that her mother taught her, so is it possible that she treats it as a way to express her love and bond with her mother, although they are no longer together? This is also consistent with my assertion that Romani represents Malin, as Kremia's and Romani's parents also died of an unknown cause prior to the events of the game. Due to this, I believe Malin could be sharing this song with Link as a subtle way to share her love with them and create a bond between them. Link's interaction with the older sister, Kremia, who represents adult Malin, gives us insight into his feelings for Malin. In a side quest, Link can help Kremia protect her milk from the attacking Gorman brothers. When completing this quest for the first time, Kremia gives Link the Romani mask, but if repeated after rewinding time, she will instead reward him with a big hug. During this, the game tech says, You feel all warm and fuzzy inside. Sigh, you could get used to this. Especially with all the naughty content going on over there, I'd have a pretty warm and fuzzy feeling too. In all seriousness though, the fact that Link gets the warm comforting feeling you get when you're with someone you love when being hugged by Kremia has to mean something significant. This is probably the most direct hint of Link's affection towards Malin slash Kremia slash Romani within Majora's Mask, but there is something Romani tells Link at some point that may be of significance. She tells him, My sister Kremia has someone in town she likes, but that person is supposed to get married the day of the carnival. I'm not going to explain the rest of the lore behind this story because the other details don't really matter in this case, but Kremia being in love with someone in Clocktown could mean something. If we continue on my idea that Kremia and Romani represent Malin, we interpret this as a message to Link that if he cares about Malin, he needs to get with her while they're young and before it's too late. After Romani tells Link about Kremia's crush, she thanks him again for helping protect the cows from abduction and invites Link to live with her in Kremia. Romani offers her bed to Link to show how much she's willing to give up for him. Ultimately though, we know that Link doesn't take the offer because he leaves Termina at the end of the game, but this is proof that Romani and Malin took an immediate liking to Link upon meeting him and want to spend more time with him. That's about all the in-game material we have for Malin. Now it's time to finally conclude who the best match for the Hero of Time is. As we mentioned, the odds are stacked against Naburu due to the age difference between her, her and Link, and that the only reason some people ship them is from one innuendo. 
Also not likely for Saria since she is a Kokiri, thus being a child forever. Ruto's affection for Link doesn't seem mutual and his descendants don't seem to be part Sora, so she's probably not his match either. That leaves us with Zelda and Malin, who, who both seem possible according to the evidence we mentioned earlier. To conclude this, we will need to look at the Hero of Twilight setting, since he is known to be a direct descendant of the Hero of Time. He lives in Ordon Village, which is a small community beyond the Farron Province, which supports themselves primarily through farming and ranching. Is ranching even a word? Link even works as a ranch hand at the Ordon Ranch. If the Hero of Time ended up marrying Princess Zelda and having children with her, his descendants would most likely not be living in such a poor region so isolated from the rest of Hyrule. Although Link is known to have spent a noteworthy amount of time with Zelda between Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, this cannot be used as evidence for Zelda over Malin since Link must have also visited Malin during this time period as well. As a child in Ocarina of Time, Epona was always at Lon Lon Ranch, meaning that after returning to the child timeline at the end of Ocarina of Time, he must have visited Malin and built up tr a trusting relationship with her so she'd let him take Epona with him on his journey as seen in Majora's Mask. Due to this and the fact that Link and Twilight Princess does not seem to have any lineage to the royal family, it seems unlikely that the Hero of Time ended up marrying Zelda. On the other hand, this information strengthens the arguments for Malin. Ordon Village does not seem too old, perhaps around 100 years, which would mean, if it, which would mean it's founded shortly after the events of Ocarina of Time. It's highly possible that following the undefined war or catastrophe that occurred after Ocarina of Time, Link and Malin got together and departed into the woods to create a new life together. Since Malin grew up on Lon Lan Ranch, and Link was raised as a Kokiri in the forest, it would make sense that they established a new home for themselves somewhere in what would become known as the Ordono Province. Since the village's main trade goods are dairy products, it makes sense that Link and Malin have brought some cattle to sustain themselves since that's what they were accustomed to. Over time, a handful of other refugees from the war slash catastrophe must have settled in the area, eventually creating Ordon Village. There's even other coincidences that connect Ordon Village with Lon Lon Ranch. In Twilight Princess, two of the village children are even named Mallow and Tallow, which if you look closely, is just Malon and Talon without the N at the end of their names. I know these are mainly inferences so it's not concrete evidence, but it appears that shipping Link and Malon still works out perfectly. So there we have it. Although there is some possibility for a romance between Link and Zelda, the best match for the Hero of Time is the young red-headed ranch girl, Malin. And finally, the last Link we will discuss in this video will be the Hero of Twilight. The most competitive bachelorettes we have for this Link are Princess Zelda, well, should be known as Queen Zelda, but that's an official title for whatever reason, Minna, Link's companion and friend throughout the game, and last but not least, Ilya, Link's childhood friend from Orlan Village. This time, our honorable mention goes to Telma, the bar owner from Castletown. We're only giving her this because I've seen a noteworthy amount of people ship Telma and Link despite the huge age gap. The only grounds for this ship is Telma's occasional wink and sometimes calling Link honey, but this is probably just due to her general flirty and strong personality, not because she's got something for this young dude, probably less than half her age. Besides, she appears to have a thing for Renato, the shaman at Kakariko Village. After Link escorts Telma, Ilya, and the wounded Prince Rallis to Kakariko Village, Telma tells Link, I may just stay here a bit longer, I'm still worried about Ilya, and, well, never mind about the rest. Immediately after saying this, the camera pans to Renato, who had just walked away moments before. Telma then chases after him, and the two begin talking. Overall, the Telma slash Renato ship makes mu much more sense than the Telma slash Link shipping, but it's still worth mentioning due to all of the online discussion. Now let's get into the real candidates, starting with Zelda. If I'm being completely honest, there isn't much regarding Twilight Princess's incarnation of Zelda with Link. After all, she's only seen a few times throughout the entire game and hardly interacts with Link at all. During her a few appearances though, we can gain a general understanding of her personality. She appears to be quiet and reserved, yet still has a selfless desire to help her kingdom. Due to the ambiguity of Link's and Zelda's relationship in Twilight Princess, many fans like to ship them together because they seem cute together, but we need to analyze Link's relationships with the other characters before we can make any assumptions about his relationships with Zelda. Since Link's companion, Midna, is with him for nearly the entire game, there's a lot more information about their relationship to work with than there is for Zelda. Initially, Midna planned to use Link for her scheme against Sant, However, after spending time with Link, she decides she needs to help him save Hyrule too. 
As the two journey together, their bond increases, and when Minna comes clean about her initial intentions, she asks Link if he will come with her to save both the Twilight and Hyrule from Sans oppression. Then she affectionately touches his face. Link responds to this with a smile, meaning he will continue to help her, which also makes sense because otherwise there wouldn't be much of a game. By the end of the game, the two are very protective of one another, which is shown during the fight with Ganondorf, when Minna uses her powers to transport Link and Zelda to safety, and Link's rage when he thinks Ganondorf killed Minna. Of course, this doesn't guarantee that Minna and Link have a romantic relationship, but it does prove they care for each other, at least as close friends. After being cursed to her int form for the entire game, Minna finally transforms into her true self after Link kills Ganondorf. When Link sees her in her humanoid form for the first time, he pauses, and Minna asks him, What? Say something. Am I so beautiful you've no words left? Link just gives her a big smile, and the credits begin. This is the only time where we see Minna actually flirting. Towards the beginning of the game, she would mischievously tease him, which later transitioned into an affectionate sarcasm. But this quote just seems like flat-out flirting to me. Finally, during a mid credit scene, Link and Zelda accompany Minna back to the mirror chamber. Before Minna uses the Mirror of Twilight to return back to her world, she tells Link, Link, I... see you later. Was Minna trying to say, Link, I love you, before she cut herself off? The world may never know. Mainly because Minna destroys the Mirror of Twilight after she goes through. If Minna had not destroyed the Mirror of Twilight, a romantic relationship between her and Link might have been possible following the events of the game, but alas, life sucks. And finally, Ilya will be the last topic of discussion before we decide the best match for the Hero of Twilight. Ilya and Link appear to be roughly the same age, maybe a year or two difference, and seem to be childhood friends. Ilya's theme shares the same melody as Epona's song from Ocarina of Time, the same song that Malin was taught by her mother. So assuming our conclusion that Malin and Link became a couple is true, this similarity between the songs implies a romantic interest be between Link and Ilya. Near the beginning of the game, Ilya notices Epona is injured and rebukes Link for not taking enough care of Epona. When Ilya's father, Bo, tries to defend Link, Ilya reprimands him too. During this, there's a funny moment where both Link and Bo are looking down at the ground while getting yelled at by Ilya, but the second she stops and turns away, they give each other this priceless look, and it's hilarious. You can totally tell they're thinking, ugh, women, or something like that. Right before Link is supposed to depart on his journey to Hyrule, and the plot of the story launches, Ilya shows how much she cares about Link when she asks him, Can you at least promise me this? No matter what happens on your journey, don't try anything. Out of your league. Please, just come home safely. In which, Link responds by giving her a big smile and nodding. Then all of the game crap happens, but let's not worry about that right now because we're too busy focusing on the love lives of fictional characters. Later, when Link awakens the light spirit Lanayru, it tells Link about the danger of the few shadows in history of Hyrule through that one super creepy cutscene. Anyone who's played the game, I'm sure, knows what I'm talking about. It begins by telling how the people of Hyrule once lived in peace, and the vision shows Link and Ilya standing together, symbolizing the people of Hyrule living in harmony. Then it tells of how rumors of the Triforce and Sacred Realm corrupted the hearts of the people and wars broke out to obtain possession of the Triforce. To represent this, Ilya's eyes are shown turning into a blink white and she pulls a knife in an attempt to kill Link. Link, however, has also been corrupted and instead kills Ilya, then pursues the Triforce. The point of using Link and Ilya in this cutscene is to show how a peaceful people, even people who care about each other, turned on each other in one of the great wars of Hyrule's history. Since the developers used Link and Ilya to represent this message, it just shows how close Link and Ilya's relationship actually is. When Link finds Ilya, she suffers from severe amnesia and doesn't even recognize Link when they meet. Once Link finds the horse call Ilya made for him at the beginning of the game and shows it to her, she spontaneously begins to remember everything. As she starts to recall everything, she tells Link, I, I knew you once. Yes, this feels so familiar. The scent of hay. When we were young, you and I. You were always there. You were always beside me. Link. In the HD remake, a tear slowly rolls down her cheek as she says that last part, and there's a short emotional montage of both of them back in Ordon Spring. After regaining her memory and quickly catching up with Link, she tells him, You don't need to worry about me any longer. When you return, I'll be waiting for you. She means this literally, too. In the final credit scenes, Ilya is shown waiting by Link's house back in Ordon Village for him to return, 
and in the very next scene, Link is shown riding a Pona through Farron Woods back towards the village. This implies that after dealing with any loose ends from his quest, Link returned back to Orion Village to resume his life there with Ilya. As we mentioned, there's no clear way of Link ever being with Minna because of the Mira Twilight being destroyed, and even though a relationship with Zelda is possible, there isn't much evidence suggesting it either. Plus, Link's return to Ordon Village at the end of the game implies that he's returning to Ilya, and thus we conclude that Ilya is the most probable match for the Hero of Twilight. To recap, we concluded that the most likely couples are Zelda with the Hero of the Sky, Malin with the Hero of Time, and Ilya with the Hero of Twilight. Remember, if you're interested in the second part of the series, please subscribe to our channel and enable notifications so you won't miss an upload. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and leave a comment letting us know what you think of our analysis and anything you think we should have included. That being said, thank you very much for watching and we hope to have you with us next time.